dive into international the sea uh, site and how to get their attention by being a Lithuanian or not necessarily Lithuanian founder. And during this discussion, we will try to understand how do they make decisions when it comes to investment. Is it the looks? Is it the skills or the founding team? Or maybe that's the vibe that attracts the tribe or both, including the numbers behind the valuation. So it's going to be very interesting to explore how do the Baltic founders actually, what do they say in front of international investors' eyes nowadays? And without no more talks, I would like to invite the investors themselves on the stage. So please welcome Tom Lehe, partner at Speed Invest. I cannot see Tom. Are you ready? Are you here? Yes. Hello. Welcome. Dominika Stankavicius, Venture Advisor at Launchpad Capital. Love us. Arin Oskula, General Partner at 500 Istanbul. I'm trying to see where is Arin. Yes, here we go. He's coming from the backstage. Alan Fonsken, Partner at Antle C. Here we go, ready with the mic. And our lovely moderator, Gerda Sakaluskaite, Managing Director at Lithuanian Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. So, hi guys. Uh, it's um, a really great opportunity, this group of international investors, uh, and we will tackle this, I think, really uh, important topic for startup founders, how to get your attention. Um, first things first, uh, it seems that uh, Baltic ecosystem, uh, Lithuania included, is um, a new hotspot for startup ecosystem. So would you agree and uh, do you notice that international VCs are starting to screen this region, Lithuania, more intensely than it used to? Um, maybe we can start from I Alan. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I think definitely, I think um, y you see more and more um, awesome companies oh, well, um, that have come out of this region that are kind of breeding the next generation of, of founders. Um, at the same time, we're seeing that um, in the typical markets where we typically invest, valuations are going up and up, so we're looking for um, kind of the next places to go. Maybe that changes short term now for the next few months, but uh, I think overall, definitely heating up. What about you, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, what do you agree? I, I definitely like completely agree. So, uh, like, like a little bit like Antler, we do invest across sort of PC and seed. So we're quite early on. Uh, so looking at those valuations, Yone from First Pick, if she sees, she had this presentation yesterday at the investor camp where she was saying, you know, uh, the valuations across the Baltics, uh, especially at the seed as well, has risen quite significantly. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of other people coming in, like uh, outside of the Baltics to invest as well. Um, so yeah, definitely. And I'm seeing, I used to come here, I think like pre-COVID, so mm -hmm. for, for a couple of times. And I was typically one of the only foreign investors back then over here. But now, like, whenever I come to any event across the Baltics, I see a lot of different faces, so. So, so we're getting there. Yeah. Nice to hear. Uh, the first um, thing when I'm thinking about founders, uh, there is some phenomenon, uh, founders charisma, uh, in terms when we're investing in startups. So I would just uh, ask you to be really, really honest. Uh, with me, have you ever invested in a startup uh, and your decision was heavily made by uh, founder's personality and strong reputation? Um, Tom? I mean, I mean, if you invest in very early companies like seed, pre-seed, uh, you don't invest in companies actually, you invest in the founders. So I think that's completely normal that you um, need also a leader who is able to motivate the team through ups and downs. So you need strong uh, charismatic guys or girls um, leading those companies. So that's completely normal. And uh, also leadership that is able to raise the next round, also able to convince uh, other investors. So it's, yeah, the earlier um, the company, the more it's actually about uh, the people. What about you guys? Anyone? Who so, I mean, 
from, from our perspective, we are the sort of very early on investor during the first ticket. So that's all we invest in pretty much. So at the time of our investment, I don't think there's any data at all uh, other than, you know, the founders themselves, their track records, what they've done, all that sort of stuff. So typically when we invest, we're really only looking at the founders. Mm -hmm. Personality wise, I mean, obviously, you know, charisma, like oh, there are all of these sort of different words that investors yeah. use, like are they driven, resilient, charismatic, they can then lead, all that sort of stuff, which does tend to get a lot of, like a little bit subjective, I would say. So everyone has their sort of different ways, weights on sort of which one to prioritize and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it is very much about the founders at, at the very early stages and it's the, the whole, I guess, um, work that we try to do, spending time with them, looking at their track records, you know, talking to them, trying to understand the market so that we can ask questions about the market to them, to yeah. try and sort of gauge whether, how sort of smart they are and all that sort of stuff, is all, all that we do pretty much at this level. And you mentioned some features already, resilient, charismatic. What, uh, what are those features for you guys personally? are the most attractive ones when you see the person for the first time maybe and oh he has this you know set of uh, features of the founder I'm looking for uh, Alan maybe uh, so I mean first of all second completely what, what these guys say I, I think we're the earliest um, yeah. uh, that there possibly is um, and what we actually do is we we work for three months with founders before we decide to invest uh, because it's all about the people um, at that stage, um, and there's, there's a number of things I think to, to your question that we always look at. So when working with people, when we build, try to build that conviction, do we do we believe in the, these individuals? Do we believe in those teams? Um, it's are they ambitious? Are they hardworking? Are they driven? Um, are they kind of willing to go the extra mile, not give up? All of this stuff I think is is, is common, um, but then when we talk about things like charisma, that doesn't mean that every single successful founder has to be the person that goes up here on stage and fills the room. Um, it then also really depends on what they're building, right? If they're building a super technical product for a technical audience, um, then you need a very different personality than um, if you're building a direct-to-consumer company. So I think then also what we look for in those founders really depends on the context. And maybe I can just add, we're investing uh, in fintechs, and if the startup is regulated, we really want to see the people who can work with the regulator. Because that's very specific for, for fintech, but we need those people who can, you know, bridge the gaps with the regulator. Even if the founder is very great and outgoing and, and so on, we need people who can actually work uh, with institutions. And maybe just yeah. to add here, we just talking about the CEO, I, I feel. In, in the end, we are uh, investing in teams, complementary teams. Um, one technical founder, one, I don't know, strong in product, the other um, in, in leading all those, uh, bringing all, everything together. So it's, it's actually about the team and then there's often one, a guy or lady who, who's, who's leading, who is potentially a bit more charismatic. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we, we actually try to avoid in um, companies with a single founder. So we always want to, that the responsibility is carried by by multiple uh, people. So what I'm hearing is, so maybe that founder importance of his charisma is maybe un understated a bit sometimes, or uh, it's just uh, he should be a good seller, uh, he should uh, work for it, and uh, you actually evaluate the whole team most of the times, and it's not uh, that that you are like always, uh, uh, fooled by uh, founders' charisma and just putting money in. So, because what I'm uh, trying, you know, to provoke this because um, uh, what I'm hearing uh, all the time that you should be like really, really charismatic, inspired to sell the product and service mm -hmm. for uh, for VCs because it's such a competitive uh, environment and you need to be. Um, is, uh, you need to be seen properly and our attention span and VC's attention span is really, really small. It's like really, really tiny window of opportunity for you sometimes, especially for I international mean, VC's. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the sort of the, that fundraiser, that, you know, that person who, who's more of a salesy type who can sell and all that sort of stuff, obviously, you know, it, it does sort of draw your attention. 
but I mean, we, we do see like across, you know, all of, the, all of these guys probably a lot of startups every year. So we'll be able to s sort of separate the real from the fake a little bit. And there are different personas for different businesses, as, as Alan said, you know, there's, there's you know, there, there, there's the fundraiser persona, there's this team leader persona, there's a very uh, introvert, very technical guy persona, but and all of them have their places with, within a startup. So, you know, it's not just, you know, you, you need so to be that sales can guy. Can introvert can be a good uh, founder and uh, sell the company well? What do you think? Have you ever had like, this kind of? Definitely. I mean, we, we've seen founders who are more introverted, who are very technical, as, as, as mentioned. But you know, from the VC's perspective, you want to invest the money today and you want the startup to raise the money. Yeah. In the next stage, the founders are going to be talking to the other VCs, right? So you want somebody in the founding team who can actually sell the idea. So again, it's about, you know, getting diverse people into one team, maybe helping them find somebody who can come into the founding team and uh, working their way through. Because if there's only one person who's introvert and very good on, on the technical part, they're not gonna progress that fast, so. So, uh, I will continue if you're done. Uh, you are very familiar with the Baltic scene here. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that Baltic founders are any different? I mean, in terms of their um, personality traits, uh, style, and so on. Would you indicate something uh, exceptional maybe you notice? Yeah, so I, th I think the, the Baltic founders, especially the, the Lithuanian ones, I think they are used to change so much. Like we've li we are living in the country that has been created, you know, from, from scratch, the legal system, currency, everything has been created in 30 plus uh, years, right? So we're r always ready for, for change. So we're resilient for that. So I think that's what I see in the local founders, which is not that common uh, in, in the Western Europe or, or other countries. So it's that resilience to change. And I think this is what uh, the local founders can actually pitch in uh, through their uh, investor, investor talks as well. Oh, we do have one uh, interesting question from the audience. What would you rec uh, recommend for uh, first-year students who participate in a fair for growing their potential per personal charisma, leadership skills, or potential startups? <laughs> so, uh, what would be like a um, tip from you guys <laughs> for early, early uh, first-year uh, students? Um. I, I think, I, I think this whole, this whole charisma thing is, is to some extent put into a box of um, kind of you genetically either have it or you don't, and I don't think so, right? I think story, it comes down a lot to storytelling, both in fundraising but also in kind of communicating your strategy to your vision, to potential hires, your team once you have them on board, etc. And just like anything else, that's a skill. And I don't think that just goes to first year students, I think that goes throughout. Um, and that's just a that's a skill that you can practice and that you can that you can build, um, and I think kind of going back to the the the, the introvert founders, I've seen brilliant storytelling introverts who don't go into a room and immediately dazzle everyone with their communication skills, but who just really have that down. Um, so I think practice. And maybe one tip for me would be if you're a first year student. Find a company that you like, find a startup that you're passionate about, their mission, work with the founders, learn from them, you know, be a sponge that absorbs the whole information, the charisma, and it will come. Like, you, you have to find the people who can lift you up, basically. And I think that's, that's pretty easy to do nowadays in the startups. They're quite open for interns coming in, so. Yes. And maybe oh. we also uh, look for founders that are actually um, where we see a lot of potential, actually, because we invested uh, in them for all, for like 10 years' time or so, and over the 10 years' time, they normally develop a lot, to, a lot, and uh, becoming charismatic people. Because uh, very early on, um, so it's all about the potential, actually, we see in them, not just, uh, yeah, because there is is a so many learnings they will do on, on the way up. Um, during building um, the venture. Let's talk about the pink uh, don'ts and mistakes. Um, in your experience, uh, what founders should don't 
do when reaching out to VCs? Uh, what are the most annoying things you do when you are just I mean, the honest? I, I, I don't. I mean, uh, there are also a lot of don'ts for VCs, and uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> should, should I, they could do better. Or I mean, um, maybe a couple of points. I mean, um, firstly, because we invest in founders. It's, uh, they can't delegate the fundraising to anyone else in the team. Often there's like, I don't know, a fundraising associate who's basically be made being responsible for, for raising the capital. But how is, she po how is he or she possible to do it? It's impossible. So it's a CEO job or founder's job um, to do it. Otherwise, um, and also to have the first call with, with the interested investors. So I think that's um, the first point. Secondly, I wouldn't involve any advisors uh, in, uh, the, in fundraising, particularly if you raise pre-seed seed, it's more like a negative signaling. Um, we, I think, investors expect the founders to do it themselves. And lastly, I would actually target the right investors, VCs. I would actually not reach out to everyone. I mean. I'm uh, focused on fintech, and I, on my LinkedIn, it's it's very clearly that I invest in only in fintech. And every day, I get like uh, pizza tech startup from the US. I don't know, whatever. I mean, that's not targeted. They waste a lot of time. It's just um, uh, sending out messages everywhere. I mean, there for certain startups, there's certain VCs generally. And then maybe lastly, VC is not one sides fits it all. I mean, VC is not always the best uh, in, uh, investor for, for every kind of startup. I mean, it really depends. Um, there are so many other forms of uh, types of financing. So I would also actually, as a founder, ask myself, do I really want to get into the VC game? Because, then in, because VC is all about big outcomes. So big outcomes, do I really want to create like a multi-billion company? Do I really want to go through this journey and, and have, I mean, um, because then I need to be able to grow like my company, double the size of my company every year and it's a lot of stress. So, I mean, VC is not, not for everyone and shouldn't be, right? So, and, and I think that's my advice. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe just uh, adding on, on that, there is a saying that founders are like, we're too busy on our day-to-day -day stuff, so we don't have time to uh, talk to the VCs. I think that's the biggest BS that you can do as a startup. This is you who are driving the investment, the strategy. If you're heads-on in customer success answering the emails, you're doing something wrong. You need to hire someone, you need to start delegating, or you need to hustle then and work 24 seven. I mean, it's, it's your choice, but you have to talk with the investors. You don't, you, exactly like as, as you said, I, I've seen companies who hire investor relationship people who've been in the company for three months, who don't have a clue about what the company does, what are the risks. So I mean, what is the value then for, for the VC, who, as you said, have a short uh, attention span to talk with the person who doesn't know the company? So I think, you know, always I would urge the founders to be in the front lines, be active, talk in the events, uh, go out there, network. I know it's hard for some people, but it's a, it's a skill that you can learn. Mm -hmm. Anything to add? <coughs> if I may, I may add one thing. I think to be deliberate about fundraising. I, I talk to so many founders who kind of are constantly latently fundraising. Um, fundraising, if you do it properly, takes a shitload of time. Um, so my advice to founders that we work with is either you're in fundraising mode or you're not. If you're not, you focus on building your business and don't waste time taking endless coffee meetings because it also takes a certain dynamic to get around together, to get that dynamic, to get that formal uh, and all of that stuff. But when you go into fundraising mode, then be deliberate. And then you need to, unless you're a serial entrepreneur that has exited before when you can just call up your friend and you get the check, you need to talk to 50 plus potential investors. You need to be targeted about that. You need to have your homework done. You need to have your shit together. And then it, when you go out in the weeks that you're fundraising, you talk to 20 plus people per week. And likely it takes 70, 80% of one founder's time. And then you get through that and then you go back to your business. But I think this doing both things half-assed um, 
is something that I would strongly discourage. And sorry, maybe just one last point on, on this one. I've, I've seen founders who will start raising when they have like one or two months runway. You're putting yourself in a very dangerous position. Please start ahead of the time, prepare, plan this very well. Because if you're desperate for the money, it shows during the pitch. And it's a very big turn off for the VCs if, if the founder is desperate to get uh, the money. So I think we are coming to an end, but I just had one small question uh, from the audience and I think we can uh, end up with, one, with this one. How should the last year student, I think there are like a lot of students here, <laughs> uh, student uh, Samuel Sam to be hired for internship at VC because it looks like mission impossible if you're not an English speaker. So it's a good topic, I think, how to get a uh, job or internship in VC. Uh, we talked about founders a lot. Uh, about the founding team, but uh, when you sh want to start somewhere in, in, in the business, um, maybe it's uh, uh, interesting to be in VC as well. So, and I think it's getting popular, isn't it? It's just um, uh, such a vivid industry, I would say. So what do you recommend? How to be hired uh, in a fund? Alan, I mean, it's, it's just like fundraising, you hustle, right? So <laughs> you, you don't talk to like three or four companies, you talk to probably 20, 25 companies. Honestly, I don't know how the sort of the general market is currently in Lithuania, but you know, maybe try and do, uh, you know, internships not only here, but across the Baltics, maybe across, you know, Europe in general, uh, try to take that leap. And you just hustle, I think, it, there's not, nothing more to do. What do you mean hustle? You should be the oh, you, you, ne you network, you write to a lot of people that you know, you do cold LinkedIn outreaches, you know, that's, that's just how it works in general, right? right. Anything? I, I would say, you know, VCs want to get more deals done, right? So you have to put yourself in the mentality where what can I bring to the VC that they would benefit at the end of the day? So if you're, I don't know, from the Baltics and you want to be doing an internship, I don't know, in Berlin, London, or here, you could say, look, I have these 20 great companies. I'm sure you're going to be interested in them. Let's talk. I, I want to present all of them to you, to you and why, why do you want to invest? So I think that at least would be a good try for uh, internship, bringing some value to, to the VC. That's a great tip. Uh, uh, Tom, Alan? I mean... <laughs> I mean, I would get up to, there's so many great VC podcasts, and it's, I mean, I would actually try to educate myself and, and getting a sense of what the VC is about and to, yeah, and, and in the end, I mean, we look for diverse backgrounds, so it's really difficult to say there's not one path to becoming a VC. We are like, everyone in our fund is very, very different. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm not also not sure whether VC is great for um, the first internship. I think you should actually go to a couple of first jobs or first internships, and then um, VC can result in, a, in, in becoming a VC. But I think, yeah, without having any experience before, it might not actually be the, the right choice. Yeah, I'm se seconding that. I think we're in the luxury position that kind of VC is the sexy thing to do. So the candidate inflow is insane that I think all of us get. Um, so that if this is your first internship, kind of the likelihood of us picking a different candidate that has done two internships at two unicorn companies um, or done an internship at a top other institution um, is just very, very high. Okay, guys, I think uh, the audience heard a lot of tips, a lot of do and don'ts. Uh, thank you for this talk. It was my pleasure. Thank Thanks. you for having us. Thank you. Thank so you, much. guys.